Um, thanks very much. Um, I'm just turning on my camera here. Um, Basani has been having uh, issues joining us. She is now uh, phoning me, um, which unfortunately is not going to work. Um, so uh, uh, she's been having um, uh, tech issues. Um, so my name is Gilad Isaacs. Uh, I work at the Institute for Economic Justice, a, a policy think tank in South Africa. I see that Basani is now um, online, which is fantastic. Um, and we've been doing work um, on COVID-19 since the outset. Um, for this audience, I've been thinking how to frame what I'm going to say. And what I really would like to try and contextualize is the utter failure um, of the South African state to respond adequately to the COVID-19 crisis, um, uh, in particular, uh, economically speaking now. Uh, despite a, a proactive public health uh, intervention at the outset, um, uh, uh, the economic response has been uh, completely inadequate. Um, uh, and I'm going to contextualize that within two uh, ideas. Um, uh, uh, the, the first is um, on South African neoliberalism um, and how that has played out. Um, there has always been in South Africa, um, as is true elsewhere, uh, a tension between more pro progressive or interventionist policies and market-centric policies. In South Africa, this is shaped by uh, the internal contradictions within the ruling um, ANC um, uh, and their engagement with business um, and, and, and a business uh, elite. Um, uh, and the boundaries of this uh, neoliberal orthodoxy um, is in particular policed by the uh, National Treasury um, and South African uh, Reserve Bank. Um, and whilst COVID-19 has disrupted uh, and weakened some of these, it has not displaced them. Um, at the same time, that is combined with severe um, uh, uh, inadequacies um, in state capacity. Um, and this is not uh, simply uh, um, arbitrary. Uh, there is, of course, with in neoliberalism, a, a selective incapacity uh, within uh, states. Um, and so that really frames what, what I think uh, explains uh, the uh, policy that we've seen unfold. I'm going to switch between sharing a screen um, and, um, and not. Uh, I am showing a graph now, um, which I am going to assume that everyone can see unless I get interrupted uh, by the chairperson. So what we note here is the COVID uh, cases. And we see this initial uh, spike. Um, and that first spike is mainly uh, uh, due to um, uh, wealthier uh, tourists and business persons coming back from uh, uh, abroad and from Europe in particular. Um, and a very hard lockdown, one of the most severe lockdowns globally, is then um, instituted. Um, uh, and that lasts for, in different guises, about a six-week period, as shown here. And that accounts for the uh, significant dip um, in uh, infections. Um, and of course, the idea of that lockdown period, originally three weeks and then two weeks, is to prepare the public health uh, response. What we've seen subsequently is a gradual opening up of economic and social activity through a staged process uh, of moving from a level five lockdown to level four to level three to what's now called advanced level three, which is basically just level two. Um, and we've seen this steady rise in infections. And this shows South Africa in relation to a range of other countries. Um, the trend and similarity with India is particularly uh, 
disturbing um, at the moment. And when I gave a presentation on an ideas webinar, Jed Tigosh noted the uh, similarities both in infection and in policy. So, so that's what the uh, trajectory of the uh, virus looks like um, here. Um, what does that mean um, economically speaking? Well, the estimated fall in GDP ranges anywhere from around minus six to up to minus 17. Um, so uh, we're looking at a, a very significant fall of which a contraction of of about 10 percent is extremely plausible. Uh, we're looking at job losses um, in excess of a million workers uh, with uh, in a country with a expanded unemployment rate of almost 40 percent. Uh, that's um, a, a, a severe crisis. Um, so initially, the South African response was extremely weak. Um, what I'm showing now is a illustration of spending as a share of GDP as of the start of, of April, which is when our lockdown had started. And South Africa is a tiny share of, of that expenditure at like 0.1% um, compared to a G20 average, which is 100 times larger. Uh, than that. Um, the, uh, uh, after much advocacy um, uh, uh, and contestation, the president announced on the 21st of April a 500 billion rand stimulus package, uh, which if you divide by 20 is roughly the number of pounds, uh, which my brain is not quite doing at, at the moment. Um, uh, and this was heralded as a, a significant uh, step forward. Um, if we look what what this means in practice, is this would uh, increase South Africa's expenditure a, as a share of of GDP and place it uh, amongst, in some ways, international norms. The spending was divided up into various elements: health. Uh, municipal support for water, sanitation, increase in social grants, which is our form of social security, um, this job advancement program, with the details of which remain completely obscure, uh, wage guarantees to, to help pay uh, workers' wages, as exist in the um, uh, UK, and then various loan guarantees and tax deferrals. Um, now, I want to point to two issues with this, which I think are illustrative of uh, what I was referring to. Um, the first is that uh, these measures, even before uh, the second incident, which I'll refer to, had been extremely poorly implemented. Um, the rollout of a, a new social grant to benefit anywhere between eight and 13 million people uh, within six weeks had uh, 10 people who had been uh, paid out. The increase to our existing child support grant um, uh, was lower than initially uh, expected. The type of wage su support has at best reached uh, under a third of the uh, workforce with 60% of the allocated funds uh, spent. Um, uh, the um, health spending uh, was failing to uh, materialize with an absence of, of, of PPE uh, across public health care uh, facilities. So a real significant um, inability to uh, um, uh, roll out this package. Um, the uh, second element which I'll point to is that on Wednesday we had uh, the tabling of our adjusted budget. It's essentially uh, a budget framework meant to give extra 
uh, to this rescue package. Um, and what we actually saw, and this is uh, led by our national treasury, I um, apologize for this dense uh, slide, our fact sheet on this is still in the works, but essentially um, uh, uh, this 500 billion has been whittled down to a net increase of 36 billion. This is because uh, some of it's failed to uh, materialize. A large portion of it has actually been reallocated existing uh, expenditure um, uh, uh, and a substantial portion is in, is in loan guarantees, which is not new expenditure. In addition to the fact that only 36 billion is new ex expenditure, the budget actually plans to implement significant budget cuts over the three-year medium-term expenditure framework. Um, so essentially, uh, we're seeing in the midst of, of a crisis, the, uh, the acceleration of austerity. This includes elements even like the health bug response in which we only see about 3 billion in new uh, ex uh, ex expenditure. Um, so that's an example of the type of responses which we've seen. Um, I'm not going to uh, really go through, um, uh, there are a number of, of other slides, but I want to sort of finally say two last points. Uh, we've tried to look at this package and assess it based on international uh, best practice, which is that it should be early, large, target households, be simple to administer, ensure survival, and then target particular sectors within the e economy. And most aspects largely fail on all of those scores. On the monetary policy side, we, we once again have seen the adherence to the existing uh, author, or, orthodoxies. We have seen uh, a, a, a interest rate cuts, um, significant but not um, uh, startling. Uh, we have seen some bond buying in the secondary markets, um, but not a expensive quantitative easing program. Uh, there's been no serious conversation of instituting capital controls, um, of uh, requiring um, uh, uh, the um, prescribed lendings from pension funds, no developmental lendings within our developmental finance institutions, um, and, and a range of other weak uh, responses. Um, so whilst we have had a, a extremely strict lockdown, we've had one of the world's weakest uh, economic uh, responses. Um, and so whilst COVID-19 does offer an opportunity to try and disrupt uh, the economic orthodoxies present, thus far those traditional centers of power have managed to uh, exercise influence over economic policy in South Africa. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gilad, for your um, contribution. That was really interesting um, to follow through. We will um, now hand over to Basani Baloy to actually um, talk about the informal sector. And then after that, we will have um, questions from the audience. Feel free, if you already have questions um, for uh, Gilad's um, subtopic, feel free to already post them um, in the chat. Thank you. Hi, um, I think we're trying to get through to Basani. Um, Basani, can you hear us? Hello?
Basani, um, it does show you as um, unmuted um, and, and your microphone as active. Um, I don't know if you can turn on your camera at the bottom of the main screen. Um, hi, everyone. Sunny, you have to turn the sound off on your computer. Okay, so I have... Hello? Hi. Um, I've got Sunny who wants to try... Apologies, everyone. She wants to try and speak through my phone on my microphone. Um, Basani, you have to mute me now, else there's feedback. Hello? Yes, that's better. Let's see if this works. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Um, I can hear you, but if you can, can hear me, that's a problem because you need to mute your computer or else there'll be feedback. Um, uh, in terms of sharing screen, I've sent you a photograph. If you can hear me, have a look on the, the bottom right. There's a purple arrow. And if you click on that purple arrow, and then there's the third icon is share content. And then the second option is share application screen. Um, we can't hear you now, so your microphone needs to be, I think we're losing, your microphone needs to be on, but uh, your speaker off. Okay, um, I am okay. sharing it, Basani. Is it possible? Okay, we have the slides. Thank you very much. Sorry about that, guys. Sorry about that. Uh, anyway. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Part of the session and discussion. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, if the informal sector in South Africa is in COVID times. COVID times, not. Oh, the sound is not working. Okay. 
Hi. Um, perhaps I could make a suggestion, which is that we take any sort of conversation around what I may have put forward, and in the meantime, Pasani tries to uh, sort out the um, uh, connection. Um, okay, so I see the, um, there's some comments in the like chat. Um, is Sibulele with us? Yes. Hi, I'm just turning on my microphone. Hi. Hello. Sorry. Hi. Um, I think that's a good suggestion, Gillard. Um, so I think one of the questions um, from the audience is, what is the trajectory for um, the COVID um, the, the COVID cases and what potential impact will that have on the GDP? So I think from the South African point of view, the peak will probably be around August, September. Um, so if the, the cases continue to peak, what is your sort of estimated impact on the GDP? Okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, you're absolutely right that the expected peak is is now being brought forward to like around um, August. Uh, the estimations of impact on GDP, I mean, as with other countries, there's a lot of guesswork which goes on here. We've done our own input-output modeling uh, with for the ILO, um, uh, and I would say a sort of, uh, and then there's all sorts of other private sector modeling from various banks and research agencies and so on, as well as the official IMF modeling. I would say that an estimate of about 10% of GDP is a safe estimate. The, the sort of estimates range between minus 5 and minus 15. Um, uh, so we're talking about a really significant hit, and of course we're talking about this hit in the context of a economy which wa was uh, already um, in recession, and of course has uh, some of the world's highest levels of, in of inequality, um, and then uh, uh, significant un unemployment um, uh, and poverty. I see there's a question here also on the public uh, reception um, uh, um, and that the public service literacy has had its problems and how are the institutions delivering these. Um, so I, I, I mean what was interesting was that there was widespread um, uh, uh, frustration prior to the April 21st announcement of the rescue package. Uh, we in, we coordinated the signing of an open letter to the president, which about 300 economists signed on. Um, and so there was uh, economists from across the spectrum, uh, uh, business persons, unionists, um, uh, civil society, all saying relatively similar things, you know, which we had seen elsewhere, which was support wages, increase social security, uh, have business uh, support measures, um, and, uh, increase health spending, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, and it took, obviously, it, it took uh, 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 three weeks before anything was, what, what was announced and five weeks before anything was implemented. And the announcement was generally greeted uh, with positivity. Um, including by ourselves, you know, uh, that gradually f faded with the failure to uh, to implement, um, uh, uh, and you know that failure to implement has been both institutional weaknesses, but has also been around the design, where they've placed the responsibilities, what type of funding um, has been allocated to institutional uh, support. Um, uh, so the failure is not simply, a, well, we don't have enough, you know, uh, hands at laptops to institute 
this. Um, I, I would say it's that sort of interaction between the um, uh, uh, particular policy orientations and, and capacity issues. Um, thank you for that. Let's see if Masani has actually managed to um, turn on her microphone. Hi, Basani. Is the audio better? Hello? I think her, her video is working, but not um, the audio for now. Um, so maybe we can ask maybe one last question um, to Ilad and see um, offline how we can actually best support. Oh, we have another question from um, Mary. So um, do you, from your opinion or from your research, Gilad, is are there any industries that are um, worse off than others, given the, the current lockdown? Yeah, I mean, I think, Mary, the, the response is probably somewhat similar to elsewhere in the world. And, and what's really interesting, uh, I mean, in a perverse kind of way, about COVID-19 is that whereas in many recessionary and crises environment, the service sectors are ones which remain quite active. Um, uh, we saw this after the 2007-8 crisis in retail, in food, and 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 uh, so on. Um, so, um, uh, but obviously in COVID those sectors are significantly hard hit because they are high contact uh, sectors and because and, and, and therefore are because of the uh, lockdown um, imposed. Uh, so, so we've seen the similar trends. The type of real-time data available, um, you know, is less in South Africa than in the US. So we don't have, you know, unemployment uh, claim figures per industry and, and so on um, uh, just yet. Um, uh, but what we're going to see is um, uh, uh, the spread and the spikes in other relatively close contact sectors also. So we'll see them uh, in mining. There's been a few spikes already um, uh, uh, due to the proximity um, in, and conditions uh, with, within uh, which workers um, uh, 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 operate. Um, and then like elsewhere in the healthcare and um, other frontline uh, services. Um, so yeah, I would say that gives a picture of where some of the sort of worst hit s sectors are. The last thing I would say is, Again, similar to some other countries, uh, the business size is is also a influencing factor. Um, despite the fact that um, a number of support measures are targeted allegedly at small and medium uh, enterprises, many of them are the type of measures which are difficult for small and medium enterprises to actually access. So, f for instance, accessing the various tax relief uh, measures require uh, fairly cumbersome accounting um, and uh, form filling out um, uh, and so on, which of course large firms have their fleets of accountants available. Um, the wage support mechanisms also are overly uh, complicated. Um, so we are, we'll see a, uh, so there's a significant sort of hit to small and medium enterprises also. Mm -hmm. and for, I mean, I think your, your points, Gilad, are very um, valid. Um, so as a suggestion, I guess, in terms of the long term, what would you say is needed, what action is needed um, by the South African government to mitigate these time lags between the, the policy um, proposal and the implementation? So what we're understanding is that it seems that there's some institutional blockers that actually hinder these policies from being um, implemented immediately. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, that's absolutely right. Just just before answering that, I I, I just wanted to uh, add to my previous comment, and it's is a it is a shame that like Bassani's had the issues um, which she has because Bassani's focus was going to be on the informal sector um, of which she knows far more than 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 I do. Um, but it's another s sector which has been particularly hard hit both by the natural playing out of how the uh, how the virus operates um, but also through uh, policy measures uh, where uh, there was a favoring for example of formal sector supermarkets over informal food uh, suppliers and a general kind of dismissal of the importance um, of the informal uh, sector um, in South Africa and probably the hardest hit workers um, were informal sector workers uh, be because formal sector workers have the um, ability to continue to earn money um, uh, despite lockdown um, uh, uh, and also the um, uh, um, uh, 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 sorry all, all the messages are distracting me um, and informal uh, workers are insufficiently covered through our, our employment insurance and um, other measures like that. Um, in terms of the kind of way forward, you know, I, I think that the crisis, again, like elsewhere, offers a um, very important uh, integration between short and medium and long term measures which are needed. Um, uh, what we of course need in South Africa is a transformation of the structure of the economy. St structural transformation is, is, is insufficiently advanced in South Africa. Um, uh, we need, uh, we s s suffer from uh, you know, both headline statistics of high un unemployment, poverty, etc., but uh, also a crisis in, in our care economies, uh, related social crises like gender-based violence, um, and a range of social ills which s stem from a dysfunctional uh, e economy. Um, and what we've argued is that what we need to do is see the rescue package elements as being uh, in stepping stones and indicative of what longer transformations um, might be able to look like. Um, so for example, uh, the expansion of uh, social grants um, through the uh, supposed new special COVID-19 grants uh, which has uh, so far largely been a failure, um, has the potential to lay a foundation for a basic income grant and for the uh, further expansion of our social sec security uh, sector. Um, uh, the uh, expansionary, if we were to, to succeed in expansionary fiscal and, uh, and and monetary policy, this could lay a foundation for the form of fiscal stimulus uh, which uh, South Africa um, uh, needs. And then we, so we need to start in, in some ways with these immediate measures, um, but they need to be framed in a way which also opens up opportunities. In the medium to long term, um, you know, and a number of uh, groups and individuals, including ourselves, um, are advancing the notion of a just recovery, um, you know, one which uh, places human and environmental s sustainability um, at the heart of what the economy uh, should be about moving forward, right? And that means the expansion of the public sector, a renewal of the commons, uh, a move to renewable energy, 
um, a, 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 a dressing of uh, our care economies um, and a restructuring of, of, of the sort of productive structure of the South African economy amongst other elements. And of course, that's a sort of, you know, wholesale kind of overhaul, but we've got to try and leverage this moment um, uh, to try and tie it uh, to those transformative policies. Sibu, I see the yeah. other question. Yeah. Yes, we have some other questions. I just wanted to check quickly if um, Basani is um, able to join us or we'll just keep moving on to other questions. Hello? Um, it seems like I think she's still having some technical difficulties. I also can't get through to her right now. Um, so we have another question about capital controls. So do you know why there hasn't been um, so much of a big push? actually um, use uh, capital controls uh, during um, the COVID crisis? Yeah, I mean, thanks, Sarah, for that question. Um, I think there's, there's, you know, a few different dimensions here. Uh, the first is uh, just an ideological uh, 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 inertia. Um, South African economic policy tends to be five, ten years behind everywhere else. We were uh, instituting the Washington consensus in the mid-1990s when it was uh, really being critiqued um, uh, elsewhere, right? Um, and the type of uh, 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 resistance to um, un unconventional e economic policies is uh, extremely entrenched, in particular within the two en entities responsible for such management, the National Treasury and the Reserve Bank. In the wake of the global financial crisis in 2008, out of a sample of 16 comparative emerging markets, South Africa was one of only two uh, countries to further liberalize uh, financial markets rather than institute controls. Um, so this is a long-standing um, uh, uh, issue. Um, at the same time, there is, I think, a, uh, I think that South Africa's integration into global financial markets needs to be altered and renegotiated. Um, uh, the type of capital controls and capital management techniques, given the fact that South Africa is a small open economy, uh, which unfortunately is re re reliant um, uh, on capital inflows at the moment to balance its current account, does mean that the implementation of those would need to be done in a sequenced um, way um, uh, and in a way which uh, you know sort of made sense in in our context uh, what the Reserve Bank and National Treasury do is simply say no we're not doing that what some uh, advocates of capital control seem to imply is that you could just have this wholesale sort of closing uh, which I also don't think is the solution um, and that I, I, I'm not sure we've successfully advanced what those controls would look like um, and how they would uh, be implemented. Great. And um, we have, a, I don't know if Eileen's question is complete, um, but I don't know if this really can also tie in with the current um, economic transformation, um, the, the topic of um, land redistribution in South Africa. I know he's going a a little bit off um, topic, but what is the place for that in um, the mid to long term economic planning for South Africa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, and unfortunately, I think Aileen just left us, um, but I think it's, you know, the 
the land question is um, is really multifaceted, um, and um, uh, uh, it ties into a number of issues. So, firstly, there's the difference between talking about rural or farming or or semi-rural land and urban land, all right? And both require significant reform, and both actually link both to the causes, consequences, um, and warnings which COVID-19 offer. Um, so, for instance, the um, anyone who has visited West South Africa uh, and lands at an airport uh, will see that you then drive to the city centers and on either side of you are large informal settlements, uh, um, particularly in Cape Town on that route, but pretty much everywhere. Um, uh, uh, and that the apartheid spatial geographies have displaced the people to uh, um, uh, uh, both in terms of where they are and in terms of how they live, right? And so, and that's not unrelated to, to what we've seen uh, in COVID-19. Uh, it's not un, 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 unrelated in the sense that you can't uh, social, uh, physically distance if one lives in a shack. Um, and it's not unrelated in the sense that uh, if you are on in a public taxi for an hour and a half uh, to and from work, uh, every day that exposes you to uh, significant risk. Um, so the uh, COVID crisis illustrates the fragilities um, within that. Uh, it illustrates the fragilities within our rural land and farming land uh, 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 division um, areas also, uh, for, for instance, on issues of food security um, uh, uh, and uh, informal food trading. Um, and, and so COVID-19, the question of land and the geographies in South Africa uh, is certainly revealed uh, 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 within COVID-19. But the fragilities are really important because COVID-19 is a precursor for the type of 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 crisis we might face uh, with climate change, um, uh, and these um, uh, elements will once again become really, really like pertinent. Um, uh, and uh, the distribution of land, uh, where people live, how they live, how they move, in what physical infrastructure. Uh, definitely have an influence um, in vulnerability uh, with with in climate crisis. So absolutely, we need to think holistically about uh, what it means to recover um, uh, from this. Uh, the last thing I'll say, because I know I am going on a lot, but I think it's a useful way of thinking about this elsewhere, is we're soon to put out a uh, brief which argues that you should understand uh, comorbidities of uh, COVID, not only in a physical health sense that there is diabetes or you have a lung problem, but that there are so social comorbidities, that if you live uh, in a shack, if you use transport, of that kind um, and so on, it exposes you to far more r risks than if you have the kind of lifestyle which I am, I, am, I am privileged to. And so we need to consider recovery and reform of our economies with a holistic notion of what risks um, are. Uh, thank you so much for that, um, Gillian. So I don't think um, we're able to reach um, Pasani. So what we might do is have her um, record a talk and then we just upload it as well um, with, the, um, with the recording of today's session. So I'll just 
if anyone in the audience actually has a question for um, Gila before we end off the, the session. Um, since no questions are coming through. So I think I have a question um, coming from from you, um, for you, Gilad. I think you talked a lot about um, some people, some um, sectors that are more at risk. Um, do you have, um, maybe at the Institute for Economic Justice, because this is also a question I've just been receiving um, from colleagues um, internationally, do you have any indication what this um, the pandemic has had on um, gender inequalities, especially gender-based uh, violence. I know it's it's currently um, a big topic right now in South Africa, for people also listening. However, I think there hasn't been such a big connection in terms of how um, Lovett is actually putting more pressure or more risk to people who are already vulnerable in this regard. So maybe you can uh, talk a little bit more about that. No, thanks. And I think that's really important. I, I mean, I've alluded to the crises of care and in gender-based violence, um, but I welcome the chance to, you know, uh, sort of profile it as, a, a, as an issue. Um, I think there's a few elements here. The first is that COVID um, uh, and one of our researchers, Sonia Falazza wrote an uh, um, uh, 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 op-ed about this, which, which I would encourage everyone to read, um, uh, uh, that the crisis highlights, that COVID highlights the various crises of care um, faced in the, the South African e economy. So South Africa, not only has there been a, dis a uh, shouldering of care work by uh, women, but there's been an ability of wealthier households to uh, transfer that onto poor black women um, in particular. Um, uh, and so um, what we have seen is that um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, so in two ways, the domestic work sector itself ha has been hard hit uh, economically, but importantly, uh, the crisis has exacerbated the care responsibilities which women uh, predominantly face, whether that is, like elsewhere, whether it is in childcare, um, uh, with schools closed, um, but, a, but, a, but a really insufficient uh, um, uh, 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 socialization of care responsibility so that the state carries far too little um, of those responsibilities. Um, so whether that's in, in child care, elderly care, um, uh, uh, food provision, water collection, um, and so on. At the same time, the collapse in social services, as we know, disproportionately impacts uh, women. Um, on the issue of gender-based violence, um, I think that both the physical nature of lockdowns um, places women at significant flag risk, um, but more broadly, the um, uh, economic collapse uh, of, of of an economy potentially has the long term uh, potentially has a long term danger in exacerbating this. Uh, without making any excuses, what is gender based violence in South Africa? Well, it's predominantly uh, 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 lower income uh, men um, who, in their own way, have been uh, exploited by the economic system or in their own way are just possessed of various things who are taking that out in a way or or uh, who who are um who whose own uh, uh um uh, whose 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 own anger and violence and mental trauma 
is being acted out on women in in our society, um, and that's not in any. I mean, I mean that's com that's absolutely reprehensible. But but what it points to is the fact that if our economy and our society unravels further, um, uh, and if men ex 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 experience further violence by the uh, economic system, uh, then the violence which is perpetrated on women will um, only increase. Um, and so it's, it's, it's of extreme concern um, uh, uh, that we both need to change our individual behaviors as men, but we also need to change the system uh, uh, within we, within we uh, live and um, operate. Thank you for um, for that um, for that answer. Um, that's also very useful to in terms of just profiling the specific problem that we have um, in South Africa. Um, I think we've reached the time now for our um, webinar. Um, and from us at so as uh, we'd like to say thank you very much um, for your very insightful and engaging um, talk. We'll be able to post um, the recording on um, Facebook and Twitter. And hopefully we can also get a, um, a recording from uh, Basani Deloy. Um, and also everyone else, um, thank you so much uh, for joining um, our webinar series. We have um, our very last one, unfortunately, um, happening on the 7th of July. So we hope to see some of you guys there. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks for in, uh, in, inviting me. Pleasure.